The next session is about innovation in sports, and we are going to be bringing up owners of some of the most well-respected franchises in sports, and all of them Babson alum. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I will not introduce them to you. I'm going to leave that to our esteemed moderator. That is Linda Pizzuti-Henry, Babson class of 2000, managing director of Boston Globe Media Partners and co-owners of the Boston Red Sox in Liverpool FC. And she is going to uh, bring on even more uh, esteemed and exciting leaders. Thank you. Thank you all so much. This is such a great thing. I'm so thrilled that Babson is taking the time to actually celebrate this accomplishment of thriving for 100 years and educating so many of us here in this room. So we have a really exciting panel of three incredible alums of Babson College. If you could, gentlemen, if you could come to the stage. We have Arthur Blank, who's class, Babson class of 63. <laughs> Arthur, there is a blank center at uh, Babson that opened when I was there, but um, Arthur is the co-founder of Home Depot and the owner and chairman of the Blank family of businesses, which includes the Atlanta Falcons and the, um, your local, the football team and the Atlanta Major League Soccer team. We also have with us Phil Castellini, Babson class of 1992. <laughs> Phil is the president and COO of the Cincinnati Reds, a Major League Baseball team. And we also have Jeff Molson, MBA class of 96. <laughs> he is the owner and CEO of the Montreal Canadiens a hockey team and is the former chairman and board member of Molson Coors Brewing Company. Gentlemen, welcome. We have such a great range of expertise on this panel, and we can talk about so many things from, from cold storage and food and, and home improvement, but the thing that we most have in common um, is sports and Babson. So we're gonna focus on that today. Um, and we're going to d dive into one particular question, which is, in the business of sports, the most important question that every professional sports thinks about, which is, what does it take to build a winning team? And the three gentlemen here today who are together for the first time ever on stage, and that's part of the magic of, of Babson, they have a lot of experience doing just that, they building winning teams. They wake up thinking about this every day and put together the right resources and personnel and a little bit of magic uh, to make that happen. We're gonna dive into what that magic is. And so while you know most people don't have to think about the wear and tear on your colleagues' elbows or um, have esteemed newspapers and radio stations report on and question every decision you make in your company. There is a lot <laughs> that we can learn from these three very effective leaders that we can bring to our own teams. So welcome, gentlemen. Thank I'm you. so thrilled to work, be you. here with you today. Um, so when I was at Babson, we had Porter's, Michael Porter's Five Forces for Strategy tattooed onto our brains. and. Um, so Michael Porter is local here, and we worked with him on understanding what the five key strategies are for um, building winning teams. And it was, for him, it was unsurprising that there would be five. And here, here's what they are, according to him, is, is number one, creating the right organizational culture. Number two, putting together the right talent. Three, creating a distinct strategy. Four, anticipating and leading how the game is changing, which is innovation, and then the fifth element is great leadership, which each of these three gentlemen have. So, Arthur, I'm gonna start with you, since your soccer club just brought a much needed championship to Atlanta just last year, and you built that team from the ground up just mm -hmm. five years ago. Right. Can you tell us about the culture that you wanted to create here at, at that new team? Well, I, I would say that uh, for us and all, all of our businesses, which, you know, several of which you mentioned, in addition to that, we operate the PGA, PGA Tour Superstores, which is the largest golf retailer in America today, and two guest ranches in, in Montana, one dealing with philanthropy and one is an open to the public guest ranch. Um, so when we, uh, when we started that venture, we, um, 
we understood, I mean, our, our culture is all about relationships. It's all about being of service to others. It's all about having purpose in what we're doing. Uh, none of it has to do with uh, returns on sales, return on investment, and things of that nature. Our basic belief is that if you do the right things for the right reasons, you kind of live with the consequences, which is usually, you know, good financial returns as well. So all of our six major cultural um, aspects of our relationships have to do with people. Um, people inside the organization, people that we're serving, uh, people in the communities that we, uh, that we uh, give back to. Uh, so I think when we started our soccer program, and one of the things was to you know, hire the very best people we can, invest in people, don't look at it as an in investment on, on, you know, on the operating statement, but rather as an investment on the balance sheet. So we, we brought in our senior management. Um, most senior one is Darren Eels, who actually is in Spain next week. He's getting the, um, the Global Award for uh, Soccer Executive of the Year. Um, we brought him in two years earlier than any other team for MLS had ever done. And he recruited people. He had uh, been the managing director of Tottenham Spurs, who competes with, yeah. with your team yep. um, in England. Um, so we were very fortunate to hire him. We hired very senior people uh, beneath him. He hired them. We supported that. Uh, we had a vision as to how we wanted the teams to play. He hired a coach who related to that vision, felt you know, it was important to him to play that way. Um, we had all the resources in place. We have the finest training grounds in, uh, in the United States, I would say, North America for soccer. Uh, a stadium, obviously, is first class. Uh, it's uh, won several awards as a uh, you know, soccer-specific soccer stadium. Uh, it's done incredibly well. So, from there, we basically asked Darren and his team to spend a couple of years in the marketplace um, without really an assignment other than understanding what soccer meant in the state of Georgia and the city of Atlanta and the Atlanta region. So by the time we were ready to turn the switch and actually begin to operate, if you will, we were highly tuned into uh, the soccer population in Atlanta. And that, you know, that demographic is very different than American football. Mm -hmm. So we, um, you know, e everything that we've done from day one, and this is our third year of operation today, of this year, um, has been focused really primarily on our fans, uh, listening to our fans, understanding our fans. Our fans feel probably much like they do in Liverpool. The fans feel like they really own the team. Um, I view myself as a custodian, a steward for them. Uh, they understand that. They feel that. Uh, so we, we were very tuned in to what, you know, the people we were serving, which is the fans, ultimately, both in terms of in-stadium experiences and have a winning team on the pitch. They were at the very top of the pyramid, and I, myself, and our senior management was at the bottom of the pitch. So, so the, your culture, yeah. what you're saying is that it's really putting people first and treating yeah, people right. well is an yeah. important part of the Well, culture. I think, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I would say it's, I mean, it's not, you know, part of it. It is it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we start in all of our businesses, whether it be fans, guests, or uh, customers in our PGA business, in who are we serving. And we always put them at the very top. We, uh, we listen to them. We respond to them. Uh, we don't question their, uh, their, their judgment. We believe in the wisdom of many is, is better than the wisdom of one. Uh, so, you know, we're not surprised the results we have. And in the soccer community, MLS has been around for 26 years now. We, after three years, we hold the 10 most attended games in the history of Major League Soccer. We broke broken every uh, record for soccer attendance in, uh, in North America, and um, and actually competing very very well with other teams throughout the world as well. And last year we won the cup, the MLS Cup. This year we won the uh, U.S. Open Cup and the uh, Campanola Cup. So we've had a congratulations. Yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, very successful team. <laughs> So your culture that you're talking about is really putting the fans, your customers, right. first. Right. So Phil, you know, one of the things that uh, we were talking um, backstage about is, is I, I quoting ba uh, Brad Stevens, a uh, head coach of the Celtics, and he was, he said that culture is like a shark; it just keeps moving. You know, it's it's always changing. So, what do what would you describe as the culture of the Reds? Well, I, I, if, if I may quickly off of Arthur's point, make, yep. make a Babson connection here. Sure. So I had the privilege of hearing your partner, Ken Langone, speak in Cincinnati, as I just mentioned right. before we came on stage. And he told a lot of the depth of the story about the creation of Home Depot and what they mm. did to evolve that culture. And the stories that you hear about how it was all about employees. It, it, it wasn't yeah. about, and, and ultimately some of the stories connected to serving the end retail customer, but to hear what they had done with employees and just anecdotal stories and 
and how they're all bought in. And just listening to you talk about uh, doing that to the soccer, I can tell you from what I heard about the career culture, the culture they've created, and here's the take home, it can be applied to any business in any right. industry. Yep. Right. And that's what's fascinating. Yeah. So right. to, Linda, right. to your question, right. we, we took over a team in 2005, first season was 06, <laughs> having run 14 different businesses in food processing and wholesale produce distribution, trucking, warehousing, uh, a lot of things outside of sport. And we were able to come in and apply general business principles and, and, and culture. It's a family business mm -hmm. that acquired and started other businesses along the way. We can show you multi-generations of families that have worked in our family businesses. And, and so there was a foundation of, of, of that. Family, entrepreneurial, you know, it's about being resourceful and uh, understanding each other and all, you know, pulling towards a common mission. So in taking over the team, similarly, we're taking over a community asset. We are stewards of the Reds, which is owned by the fans of Reds country, which we define as a four state, 150 mile radius. It's a regional team. Mm -hmm. And technically the team had gotten to be where it was kind of marketing itself just in the greater Cincinnati area. Mm -hmm. So well, the, we, we needed to reestablish the brand and the franchise as a regional franchise. We had to re-engage the community in, in ways that we weren't. The marketing was a little sleep at the wheel. You know, here's our schedule, here's our, uh, you know, the, the ticket office, you know, call yeah. us and we'll sell you a ticket. You know, now it's much more proactive in the, uh, you know, internet coming on board and all the different things you had to do. So culturally, the first thing we did, having not ever operated in the space, is benchmark as many teams as we could in about a three month period. And, and, and you all at the Red Sox were gracious hosts of ours. And, and we were able to hear the story about rebuilding the San Diego franchise mm -hmm. even before the Florida experience. And that was much more in line with what we needed to do with the Reds was to reestablish and re-engage the community. And, and we did it in, in all facets, in the community, on the field, off the field, in the business, the sponsorship, retail, just a, a focus. And again, having not done it, we came to it as fans first. We came to it with things we were frustrated with as season ticket holders and suite holders and things we'd like to see different. And then we asked a whole lot about how to do that. And then effectively, we really had to tear the whole infrastructure of the front office down. It, at the time, you know, we're the oldest team in, in, in baseball, just celebrating 150 years this That's year. Great. So you can imagine 14 years ago, there was a whole lot of, there was a whole lot in the room <coughs> to, and a whole lot of the same old, same old over time. And so there's beauty and tradition, but organizationally things can get stale as well. And so we, we went through the process of tearing that down. And I would say in the first phase, there was a focus on growing revenue to reinvest in the team. And along the way, we got feedback from other departments like, oh, you guys care about is corporate and tickets and, and not paying attention to the, what I'd say is the service departments within the fulfillment of all that sales work that you do, that game day experience. And then the third layer came to, uh, you know, there's 1,500 people that deploy a game day execution to mm -hmm. the fan. We employ about 160 of those people full time. So you have ticket takers and ushers in our geography, our unions. Delaware North Sports Service runs our food and beverage and retail operations. You have fire, police, you know, people, you know, every one of those people is touching the fan experience. So we had to create a training model, a customer service model. Now we train all 1,500, 2,000 people every year in our, what we call the Reds Way customer training. And it's, again, it's been about fan first so, and people within the building to deliver that experience. The Reds Way. That's, yeah. a, that's a sort of culture that I'm trying you know, to, kind of to pull out. It, right? what, yeah. what is the Reds Way? So you're saying it's the customer experience putting the fan. So we get there in 06, uh, 7, 8, market kind of hits the fan, if you recall, back yeah. in 8, 9. And so we, we, we were making improvements to the ballpark. And that's kind of what we were talking about each offseason. There wasn't going to be any for a season or two. And we realized that we had to focus on fan experience. We thought we were good at it, but not great. Mm -hmm. And we knew we weren't measuring it. And so we deployed, we kind of stole shamelessly from the Ritz-Carlton model and the Disney model and kind of fused it to together and created what we call as the Reds way. And that's the customer service training we now do every season. So that you're both your people, the customer experience. And, and in order to do that, you really need to build the right team, which is the second aspect that we're talking about. Jeff, what do you in your organization look at besides just sort of straight talent? Well, how do you find the right team members for your organization? That's a good question. Um, first, I, I want to acknowledge that I'm in hostile territory here, uh, being the Montreal Canadiens. Yeah. So uh, everything I say, um, I'm going to be very careful not to, uh, not to divulge our secret for those big bad Bruins. Um, but uh, no, we, we've, uh, I, I, before I get into that, I just want to, I want to uh, provide a slightly different perspective, but similar sure. perspective to what I was hearing. In terms of the culture? Uh, in terms of the culture. Yeah. And, and uh, our, our family, uh, 
our family founded the, the Molson Beer Company in 1786. So I'm, I'm part of the seventh generation of Molsons that owns Molson's Coors Brewing Company now. Um, and it's been there for 230 something years. Um, and we are deeply rooted in the community, very deeply rooted. So if you look at the, the first hospital in Montreal was built by Molson's, the first school, the first, uh, the railroad that crossed the, the province. There, there's so much depth in the community. And our culture starts with that. Mm. Um, and um, So your culture starts with your location and being part of the city that you're in. Being part of the city in every way we, we possibly can. And, and it's really important to us. And that, that ties in the fans as well. Mm -hmm. um, but the way we think about it is, is community. And so that our, the people in our, in our organization are part of the community. And so back to your question, when we draft, uh, when we draft a player, um, the kid, the kid is 18 years old, right, um, or 19 years old. Still growing. Still growing, <laughs> and um, there's no question they're drafted because they have talent. But throughout the course of their career, we need to surround them uh, with the right people, the right resources, and the right education, so that they do become leaders, and so they do become performers, winners, uh, team players, and all these things. And so. Um, it, Everyone that we hire in our organization plays an important role. So if it's the doctors who are taking care of uh, the player um, to, to make sure they stay, stay healthy, or the trainers, um, or take care of the player's families, mm. um, because that's important too, the family's important. Um, and then the coaching staff, obviously we want to hire the best possible coaching staff. And we surround these players with the most possible resources so that they can become professionals. Mm. Um, because at the beginning, they're just talented little kids. Um, and by the time they're 25, you hope they're going to learn, listen, and, and be leaders and start to deliver on the ice. Um, so for us, uh, for me at least, um, I want to make sure that we are top tier in everything we do. And it's, it's everything from how we travel, type of hotels we stay in, uh, how we feed our players, how we educate them on nutrition. E everything, everyone plays a role to make sure that our talented players become real pros. Yeah. And so when you're looking at talent, it's, it's so much more than just skill. Yeah. But right? let me, that you uh, if I can, Linda, sure. this, is, we can, this is all family, right? Yes. So we can talk amongst family. Uh, uh, totally. So I mean, don't, I mean I'm not a, a basketball expert, so I wouldn't want to argue about basketball with Brad Stevens, but I would argue with that quote. That oh, quote. that culture's like a shark, uh, it keeps yeah, moving? Yeah, because the one thing culture doesn't do, it doesn't keep moving, in my opinion. Culture represents the foundation and the roots and the pillars of all, you know, in our case, all of our business, whether it be soccer, football, stadium, guest ranches, PGA superstores, whatever it may be, our foundation itself. So I think you know, those, those pillars that represent our core culture, they don't change. Mm. Now the applications are gonna change, you have to change with the times, et cetera, et cetera, but understanding those key relationships and honoring those relationships and supporting those relationships with the best resources in every way, shape, and form you can, those things really do not change. Um, but the business model may change. And so when you're looking for the right talent to, um, to fulfill that culture and to fit right. in with that culture, what do you look for besides just skill for that particular job? And again, yeah. there are so many positions. Right. When, when people think about sports, they'll, they'll right. think about what's on the team. But as you're mentioning, you have trainers, you have doctors, right. you have ticket sellers, you have ushers, you yeah. have sort of the, really yeah. the full range. So what- well, I'll tell you a quick story. When, uh, when we were at, at, at Home Depot, and we only had four stores in Atlanta. Today there's 2,200 stores. Uh, four stores in Atlanta, a gentleman visited us who was the, then one of the managing partners for Goldman Sachs. His name was Joe Ellis. He was a senior executive there, and, and uh, I was a young man then. Um, and we had lunch together, and Joe said, you know, you realize after you expand from Atlanta, we were going to go South Florida next. This unique culture that you have, uh, you, you're not going to be able to carry that with you every place you go. You just can't. Uh, so. It really troubled me because I knew our culture was a big part of our, uh, of our success. So I thought about it for a couple of weeks, went to see my partner, Bernie Marcus, and I said, Bernie, you know, I had lunch with Joe Ellis a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he said, you know, this unique culture that we have in Atlanta, which we knew we had, was something that we, that we would not be able to continue to grow with and make, a, make ourselves a, basically the, the, um, the nucleus of our businesses going forward. 
And uh, I said, the only way we can do that uh, is that if we make, in terms of our succession planning process, which at that point wasn't as formal as it became in years to come, is that if we make the first barrier, the first question, the first standard, the first thing that anybody internally or externally had a had to deal with was our culture. Do they get it? Do they understand it? Do they live it? Do they articulate it? Uh, do they, are they ambassadors for it? So we put their ability to be a great merchant, be a great operator, be a great whatever it may be, and that's true in all of our businesses today. Second, mm. to do they understand the culture and uh, do they live the culture? Because if they can't do that, whatever, however good they may be at whatever they, their role may be, they're not going to be really successful, and they're going to pass on and make decisions that you know we wouldn't be making, uh, and we want them to make the same decisions because obviously, you know, all these businesses are far flung and they're and they're broad. So, culture—it's not only a question of having it initially, but then how do you maintain it? You maintain it, in my view, a variety of ways, but one of the most important ways is make sure you hire, recruit, uh, promote people, and understand and live your culture. It's the most critical thing that you can do. It's a really interesting way of looking at, at um, talent and hiring talent by putting the cultural fit first. First, yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah. that's something, you know, you, you talk, you know, I'm sure that you, you talk about in your organizations as well as sort of the locker room. There's a talent on the field and then there's the, right. the locker room personality and, and how that fits, which is also another yeah. way of saying, as you're, you're articulating so well, of, of maintaining a certain culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I mean, one of my closest partner friend in the NFL is Robert Kraft. So we're in Boston. Uh, would I have signed Antonio Brown? No. I mean, it wouldn't be up to me to sign him. It would be up to our coaches and general manager. But, you know, in terms of the locker room, there's a culture also, to your point. You understand that well as, as your husband. But, I mean, you want people to, to fit in the locker room that are going to fit in, in terms of chemistry, in terms of support, creating what we call a, a brotherhood, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's really critical because if you have all these unique personalities, you can have them, but as long as they, they uh, subordinate themselves to the culture and to what's the best thing for the team as a team, not themselves personally, you're going to be successful. So, uh, I would uh, chime in to, to Arthur's point there. I think the way I view culture, it's a living, breathing thing. Mm -hmm. You don't create it and it's done, right? And so we're in this kind of maturity cycle 14 years in now. As I mentioned earlier, we went through this kind of rebuilding and creating a new culture on the foundation of a, of a great franchise and a culture there, but building upon it, changing it. And we're now you know, at stride to where we have to keep feeding it. Mm -hmm. and, and you bring up a great point. One of the ways that you can you know, think about, about it like a, a plant, what are you feeding it? It's, you know, the, the nutrients, water, sunlight, appropriate amounts of all. And you bring someone into your culture that can be a toxic element. And right. it doesn't matter what side of the business. Right or what kind of business it is. It's that type of thing that can really be disruptive to what was yesterday a healthy mm. culture. So it's not just about feeding what's there, it's as you partner, right. expand, bring on right. new people, you have to constantly protect against bringing in anything that can be a toxic negative to, to something that at least to date maybe you feel like you've built out as a great culture. And that's, that's a great point to bring up about how to, how to maintain uh, something that's that fluid and, and it's, you know, it's I would say, you know, in, in your case, when you look at a family that's run a business for seven generations, mm -hmm. I mean, the ability to do that to the family and to the business and to the identity of the business is really critical because I'm sure, you know, the beer business, I'm not an expert in it by any means, but, but the beer business, I'm sure, has changed in distribution and likes and dislikes and things of that nature. But, you know, it's, it's not easy to go from one generation to the next generation to the next generation seven times over. Um, it's not, not many people that I've known have been able to do that very successfully. So it's, uh, you know, and I'm sure that passing that culture on, that Molson culture on, is a critical part of, of um, you know, of that success you've had. You're right. So, yeah. yeah. The third aspect is um, cr uh, for building a winning team is creating a distinct strategy. And one of the things that I, I can hear from all three of you is you're bringing in your non-sport experience from three very different right. um, backgrounds into your experience and into your strategy and your philosophy in um, sport now. So I don't know if you can talk to me a little bit about, how, I'm going to start with you, Jeff, about how you create a distinct strategy and also how you tie in your previous business experience into that. 
Yeah, so I mean, in, in uh, seven generations of, of the beer business, uh, you're right, it changes a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, strategies, strategies come and go, uh, but the vision remains the same, and that's mm. to offer the best product you possibly can to your consumers at all times. Um, and you know, the products will change, the types of distribution will change. Um, but for me, having a good strategy as, as an owner or mm -hmm. as a CEO uh, starts with hiring the right people. Um, and um, I rely heavily on, uh, on, on the, the senior managers within the organization um, to, to lead that. Uh, because my role really, if I start dictating what the strategy is or mm -hmm. dictating what, what we need to do as a business, then everyone's probably going to just listen to me, right? And, and we're probably going to make some mistakes along the way. If I listen to my team and let them tell me what they think the strategy is, I'm going to make a much more educated decision yeah. Um, to be able to support it. And I, you know, I, I believe in a vision, I believe in having strategies, but I also believe they're going to change. And they could change from one week to another, um, or they could change from five years to, five years to another, five years. Uh, and in our case, you know, we have the luxury of being able to, to think long term. Um, and yeah, for us... A few hundred years, few hundred yeah. years. You can think in terms <laughs> of decades. But, but for us, long term for us, it's, I, I mean, we're, we're all being a little bit redundant here, but Long term for us is being part of the community and to build our business through the community and to, con and to give back to the community. And we keep doing those things and mm -hmm. that, keeps, that keeps, us, keeps us going. Um, and we surround ourselves with, with the right people who are, gonna, who are gonna drive the strategy and, and maintain that culture. Phil, talk to us about the, your strategy and how you were able to create a distinct strategy. So, um, you know, one of the challenges on the business side of all of these sports is Team performance so much dictates how easy or difficult the jobs of the corporate ticket sellers are, right? And so, wind at your back, it's you're, you're you know you're picking up the phone, uh, wind in your face, you're, you're you're you know ten calls for every one sale kind of stuff or more. And so, this is we've been in a rebuild at the Reds for a few years now, you know, promising days to come, but it's been a challenge. So you find yourself trying to control the controllable and, and make it the best experience you can and take advantage of every little nuance opportunity that exists. So, you know, last year it was more about matchups and teams coming into town and what have you, uh, because it was pretty much understood that the team wasn't gonna go anywhere competitively. This year we had the 150th anniversary celebration, so we really took full advantage of everything we could and built out a year-long celebration. And we, we anticipated the team to be better, which it has been, uh, but not as good as, as hoped. And so. The, the, the strategy of this particular year and to realize every single opportunity that could, that could be derived from celebrating that 150th anniversary, which is a big deal in any institution, um, we, we really laid out a great plan that allowed that celebration to take place all year long, that regardless of what happened team performance-wise, we had a plan in place to keep interest all year long, including this, this last week, we've got one last homestand, and Marty Brenneman, our 46-year Radio Hall of Fame broadcasters retiring, and we're making, you know, it's the month of Marty uh, that we invented like six weeks ago. So, you know, <laughs> so your strategy you, you do what you can is, as well. is off the field to compel people towards the game and the sport right. and the team and, you know, really celebrating those right. aspects. Parallel areas. path, we've got the whole other side of the organization trying to build a, you know, world championship baseball mm -hmm. team as well, but you know, it's really the tale of two businesses, as you know, and so w we do what we can strategically on the business side year to year. And how about you, Arthur? Is there, what, how do you create a s distinct strategy and sort of what do you pull from your- In terms of the team on the field? Um, oh, in terms of the, the, both the team and <clears throat> sort of both sides of the team, okay. the business and the actual- Well, the, as I said earlier, in terms of the, you know, from a business standpoint, that's never going to change. Yeah. I mean, up here is going to be who we're serving, regardless of the business. Those same values that Ken spoke, Ken Langone spoke at, at your situation in Cincinnati are the same values that we use today. And the beauty of those six core values is that we apply them identically to all of our businesses, all different businesses, you know, including our foundation. So they don't, they don't really change. Um, I think in terms of the performance on the field, we, we obviously we're all in, in businesses, if you will, sports businesses now we're talking about, where somebody's going to be first and somebody's going to be last. So I think from a fan perspective, my view is that fans just need to feel 
that the owner has put all his chips in the middle of the table, mm -hmm. that there's no holding back, the owner will do whatever it takes to create a winning environment, hire the best coaches, have the best resources, retain the best players, uh, make sure you have the environment to uh, create an environment where free agents, whether you're free agents or somebody else's, want to stay with you or join you, uh, and your chances for success then are the, are the greatest. In the NFL, uh, you know, su succession and continuity really matters a great deal. So. Uh, the teams that are most successful, you know, in the NFL is an example, uh, where the coach and the general manager have stayed together for the longest period of time because they don't have constant turnover and scheme and philosophy and how they're going to play offense or defense or whatever it may be. Uh, you'd be amazed when you change a coach, somebody else's draft pick, number one draft pick from a year ago, is somebody else's child, so they don't even know the person's name. So it's, you know, a very talented individual in, in almost every case. So. Um, I, I think the owner has to hire the best people, give them, the, give them the resources, get out of their way, understand that for me there's a very bright line, so I'm not involved in the draft, I'm not involved in free agency, I'm involved in selling the organization, I'm involved in helping create the environment, but I'm letting the experts, they make those decisions. And, um, and you know, you just, you support them. Uh, and then during the season you become a really good cheerleader. That's my major role, during the season. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you're, I mean, you're each all fantastic stewards. There's, I want to talk about innovation because it, that sort of what you're talking about, your strategy ties into innovation. And, and we all work in companies, everybody in this room works at a company and in industry that requires constant innovation and change. And I think that sometimes people who work in newer companies have this misconception that, you know, older industries and established companies like sports teams don't need to innovate as much. And I work in a newspaper which is as old and traditional as it gets in some ways, but innovation is a constant state of life for, for us. And it's the same things both on the, on the individual um, team level as well as the league level um, where there's a lot of innovation and change. The NHL is, uh, is doing a great job of, of changing and adapting. Can you talk to us a little bit about innovation? And I know that you're on the Board of Governors there, so can you talk to us about how the, an old established sport that's successful is continuing to innovate? Yeah, I think, I think the NHL has done a, a, over the course of the past 10 years or so, the under, NHL has done a really good job um, lis listening mm -hmm. and, a, and adapting the game to what fans want to see. Um, and that's come through rule changes. Um, and so um, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the most obvious one in, in our sport uh, is the, the game was starting to get really slow and, and, and people, were, people were holding on to each other on the ice and, and hooking and it was, it was a judgment call. Um, and they took, they took any form of holding or, or, or hooking um, away from the game. So, so everyone pretty much in the first year was kind of tough. There were a lot more penalties called, but everyone stopped doing it. And then all of a sudden you had uh, smaller players that were faster and more talented that could compete. Mm -hmm. um, and the game just got faster and more goals were scored um, and, um, and the whole game changed. And so if you look at video from hockey, hockey in the 90s and hockey in the 2000s, it's a completely different game, completely different game. Um, there's no more fighting in it. The rules, so there's very little fighting um, um, compared to... Uh, it's on <laughs> roll. <laughs> there's a lot of fighting between the Bruins and the Canadians. So that's a, <laughs> but uh, there's... Uh, and so, so that's on the, on, the, on the hockey side. I think yep. uh, the, the NHL has been really good about adapting itself to, to what fans want to see. But on the business side, it has changed you know, significantly. And, and all the leagues, we, we all follow each other, and, and each one of us... Um, has, in, has good innovation in our leagues, but the NHL has been pretty good about how it's developed its social media platforms and how it's engaged in content development um, and sort of embraced uh, what fans want to see now. Um, fans don't, um, for all those of us, of us who have children who love hockey or uh, baseball or, or football or soccer, uh, my kids love hockey, but they don't sit there and watch a hockey game for three hours with me. Um, they watch all kinds of different stuff, and they want to see a 30-second clip of the goal. They don't want to watch. They don't want to wait a whole period to watch the goal get scored. Um, all these things, the NHL has to adapt, and it's doing a great job keeping up with it. And I think we're going to start to see it accelerate now. Yeah. The NFL has also been a been a, a real leader and innovator. Right. And just, I mean, the rules change every year, and it's just sort of constantly evaluating. And you know, in a lot of ways, the NFL is considered to be the premier sport in the U.S. Mm. And it's 
the fact that that league keeps on innovating and changing, I think, says a lot about. Well, the I, I, it's the same uh, the same points I think that you know that Jeff made. Is I, I mean, I think you you have a, a younger you have an emerging fan base that uh, doesn't have the um, you know, it's, it's probably fused by technology, but they don't have the patience to sit necessarily for three hours and to watch, you know, one game. So they, we've done a variety of things in terms of uh, commercial breaks and things of that nature. The pace of game on the field is a major concern to Commissioner Goodell, and we've, we've d changed that, the rule changes, et cetera. We're always concerned about player safety and health. So there's a variety of things in terms of the game itself, making sure it uh, stays attractive, it stays appropriate, uh, and. In terms of the distribution of the product today, it's changing really dramatically. We're in the middle of our CBA negotiations mm -hmm. now, and uh, in a side conversation I had with the commissioner maybe you know, six, six months ago, and I would say that our media contracts, which are up for renewal soon after the CBA is going to be done, will be more complicated than the CBA because of the complexity of the distribution today. Um, the other thing I would say in terms of innovation, um, I, I think it's you know, it's a responsibility as, a, as an owner of a franchise, you can't totally depend on what's happening at the league level. I mean, you have to be an innovator yourself. So one of the major challenges in the NFL, and maybe in hockey and maybe in baseball as well, is, you know, how do you create an environment within the stadium or in the arena uh, that's keeping fans there and keeping them excited and wanting to come and feeling like this is a good use of my time, et cetera. So, a year ago, or actually three years ago, I should say, when we first opened up Mercedes-Benz Stadium in 17, we cut our food and beverage prices by 50 percent from where they were next door in the Georgia Dome, which was actually an adjacent property owned by the state. This is when we had the ability to control the operations in the stadium. So everything was cut, without an exception, all by 50 percent. And um, when I first announced that to our staff, or talked about it to our staff, I mean, I had as much you know, discussion is, is having right now in this room with stone silence. Because every, every, everybody thought that I had gone crazy. They were, they were checking yeah. your pulse. Oh, they are checking my pulse. What is it I talking about, et cetera, et cetera. But because I had the history of doing much of the same thing at Home Depot for, you know, the 23 years that I was there. Um, so I understood, you know, I thought I understood what the response would be. So we cut all these prices by, by, by 50 percent. So the following year, I mean, based on the full year's experience, the, our revenue uh, went up by 120 percent. So we not only recovered the 50 percent reduction, the per caps went up by 20, 25 percent above that. For the last two years in a row, both, both in the National Football League and Major League Soccer, amongst 32 and 30, 30 clubs, uh, we've been voted number one by the fan across all teams, across both of those leagues in terms of fan, fan experience. And a large part of that is because of the food and beverage. Mm. But that's listening to the fans and responding to them, because we, with some complaints we couldn't do something about, we couldn't guarantee we were going to win every Sunday. I mean, just we, we'd like to, but we couldn't do that. But we, what we can control, to the point made earlier, we wanted to control. So one of the major concerns, and I remember as a young man with a young family and not a lot of money, you know, going to a ballpark and, you know, having to, you know, feed my kids before or afterward, whatever it may be, and have, you know, it was just very expensive when we were captured inside the stadium. And the, annoyance that I would feel about, God, why do they have to charge so much? I go outside the stadium and pay half the price for the same thing. And so we wanted to eliminate that. And it was a way to say thank you to the fans for their energy, for their passion, their financial support, for everything they were giving us. And they've acknowledged that. So um, it's, uh, you know, thank you. I appreciate that. So we've had, we've had, we probably had uh, 20, 25 teams across the NFL, college football, uh, you know, a variety of stadiums and regions have followed that yes, same model. We have to. Oh, have you really? No, we've, we're, we're studying your model. Oh, great. Well, you, I mean, and that's, you know, the beauty of this partnership is that, you know, what you see up here today, I mean, if Jeff was interested, he'd say, well, I'd like to come to Atlanta and visit you and sit down with all the people who are directly involved in that program and how does it work. It's, well, I'd be happy to do that. I mean, it's, you know, because part of the reason I made, wanted to make those changes was not just for the Atlanta market. But I really felt like, you know, food and beverage was an abusive item to people across the United States, I mean, and probably the world for that matter, in stadiums and arenas. And I really tr was trying to set a good example, a role model example, and that's taken off really well. I'm really pleased about that. And results from other teams and clubs has been very similar. In fact, uh, our next door neighbors, which is the Atlanta Hawks, uh, 
their owner, a um, really nice guy, Tony Ressler, grabbed me, this was a, a couple of months ago, and said, you know, you are, one expression, he said, you are a pain in my ass. He said, because, you know, what, now, this is just like you know, 200 yards away, so <laughs> people are paying half what they're paying here. So I had to cut my prices to, you know, the same levels, the same 50% off everything that was selling the building. So he was telling me they went from number 17 in the NBA to number one in terms of food and beverage and fan experience because of that change. So um, it works. I mean, people, people want to be appreciated, and they want to know ownership really has a deep, deep sensitivity and deep caring for the people that are supporting our businesses. Do you want to talk about innovation in MLB? Yeah, and, and a couple just to, to piggyback on the last point. I, I think it's a challenge in live sport. Um, we're pricing the consumer out of the building, mm. and, and there's no question. And a lot of corporate sponsorships have built in you know, increases in costs every year that are contractually connected to sponsorships, and there's a lot of different reasons why that you have that creep, but you have to take the bold initiative as Arthur's done there and, and others will follow. What, what we did, we're still paying Joey Votto, so I can't afford to give him <laughs> 50% back yeah, just yet. Yeah. Um, but we've got, we, we started back in 08 and 09, um, you know, we, we, in partnership with Kroger, did a value meal deal. We had dollar stands for, you know, about the last eight years or so. And then we also allow fans to bring in food and unopened containers of non-alcoholic uh, beverage, which very few venues let you brown bag it, right? So those are a couple things we did to try to respond to that, you know, cost of venue. But in terms of innovation, I'll, I'll touch on two fronts. In the, in the stadium, again, we stole shamelessly from all sports, movie theaters, malls, kiosks, and airports, you know, all, all of that. And, and we really looked at the changing demographic, how are we going to get the next 50 years of fans engaged? Mm -hmm. and, those fans want to approach our game differently than the fans of, of the last 150 years in, in our game, America's pastime. And, and we've kind of leaned on the purity and the history and the tradition of it. But, but as an industry, we have to get more innovative in what we're going to do next. I'll come back to that. But in stadium, a lot of the changes we made, we had the 50, you know, it's, it's uh, 43 fixed stadium seats. And everything we've done, we've invested over, you know, almost $40 million in the park in the last 14 years, and all of the different changes we've made have created non-traditional ways to see the game, more social ways to see the game, special ticket packages for millennials who don't even want to see. Just give me a cool area right. to hang out and somewhere right. to stand and, and put my Bud Lighter Molson and Molson. Uh, watch the game. Molson. And, and Molson. so yeah. we, we, we had a saying for a while, um, you know, when we saw a problem, we threw a bar at it. We've done that successfully 29 times 29 since new, 2006. 29 new ballpark. bars. Yeah, and just you know d different ways. So, and and I can tell you, it was fun. About in the last three or four years, we were constantly always going out to benchmark the next coolest thing, whether it be in a. You know, we came up to Boston with with Delaware North when they redid the Garden the first time and, and saw a lot of those changes. So we go to, you know, NFL stadiums, all kinds of different venues to get ideas. And in the last three or four years, we've had people come to benchmark some of the things we've done at the Red. So that's when we kind of felt good about we're, we're, we're maybe now being a little bit more innovative than just copycats, although I don't mind being a copycat when it works. Um, and so shifting back to our game, mm -hmm. the game of baseball, again, 150 years old as an industry, um, uh, you know, very little has changed, really, if you think about it. And we are now just starting to see and at the leadership level recognize we have to modernize the game of baseball. It's the, it's the sport that has the most games in season um, and, and the repetitive nature of it, as I said, the expense of the, of the live venues, um, the, the, the youth playing it. You know, I've got five kids myself, and as I was, uh, you know, got married and was having kids, those before me were giving me tips like, okay, when your kids get older, stay away from anything that ends in meat. Swim meat, track meat, wrestling meat. Okay? You spend all day and, and your kid does something for a minute and a half and you're done. And you're back in the minivan driving three hours back to wherever you came from. Parents in the room feel me? Yeah. Um, so similarly, I, I now hear parents talking to each other about, oh, whatever you do, don't let your kid play baseball. Because the, the, at the young level, it is a brutal game. We're playing basically major league baseball rules at, 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 at you know, six to ten years old. Like, they can't play catch, but we're letting them steal. And, and, it's, it's, it, and it's, it's, we have to change how we teach the game. We have to get the kids hooked on the game at a young age, playing it so that they'll stay engaged as fans. You might be able to get them later as an entertainment venue and, and mm -hmm. set the hook there, but it's criti critically important for us to start at the youth level 
to keep the engagement, and then we have to make the game more exciting and faster. You, you know, to your point, nobody's going to do it for you know three hours. And, and trust me, I, as I told you before um, we came up here, I re-engaged in the playoffs this season, and I played ice hockey and haven't watched it in a long time, and it was amazing. It was a great playoffs, a lot of full game series and all that. And I think the action, I still believe it's one of the most exciting live sports to watch, either in venue or on TV. And we just have to do more to the game of baseball to engage the fan of the future, or, or we're gonna start to you know, challenge ourselves for the game to be as healthy as it has been. And I know we're working on that at the league level. On Tuesday night, we had uh, the Red Sox were playing the San Francisco Giants, and we, it was a six hour game. Oh. And there we we had a rec we tied the record for pitching changes, which is 24 oh my Lord. pitching yeah. changes yeah. within yeah. the game. So, mm. um, but but that being said, there's a lot of things in the work within. So the game of baseball is innovating. The game of NHL and the game of, within the NFL are constantly looking at themselves. And even though there there are successful products right. that are working, that doesn't mean that on the league level or on the team level, any right. of us can rest with that. And the, the last of the five um, key uh, ingredients for building a winning team is great leadership. And there's something that all three of you have talked about, which is stealing ideas from each other. Uh, and right. we, uh, that's why I'm saying it. And the other is, is learning from the other teams. You talked about how your best friend in sports is Bob Kraft. And you, know, you have come here to Boston. You've learned from the Red Sox. You've learned from other. I think that this, this idea of it's not a zero-sum game. Right. It is on the field. Yeah. But on, from the business level, which is where you sit, it is not. It is where you're interested in the health of the league. You're interested in collaborating. You're not competing right. with the, none of you. None of you are competing with each other. No, that's that's, true, that's yeah. exactly right. I mean, if, if yeah. you if you compare it to consumer products, Molson versus Bud Light, um, you're competing in every market you're in, right? And in sports, you're the only team in your market. And uh, so on the ice, when the teams are visiting us, obviously it's heavy, heavy competition, but everything else we do is uh, we're all very happy to share our ideas. I mean, almost everything, not obviously not scouting and that kind of stuff, but anything business related that we do is, uh, um, is open game. And, the, and the, the friendlier we are with each other off the ice, the more we're all going to accomplish to make the game a better game. And I would add, add do, you, do you want to add to well, that? I, well? I would say it takes, um, I, I would agree completely with what Jeff said, but I, I think it takes um, uh, core humility um, and understanding that really it's the wisdom of many versus the wisdom of one. So whether it be in listening to your customers mm -hmm. and um, people you're serving, fans in this case we're talking about in terms of sports teams, and understanding, and I tell our senior executives, I said, look, at, I mean, they, you know, when they're telling us something in mass, um, I, I'm not interested in reinterpretation or refiltering or you know a repositioning of what they're saying. If we just do what they're asking us to do and respond in a meaningful way, we're going to get the kind of results we're looking for. So that was the success of Home Depot for many many years. We, we said you know for 20, 23 now 40 years it's that the yellow brick road in the case of HD was following where the customers wanted to take us mm -hmm. uh, and just responding to that, being sensitive to them understanding they really were wiser than we were in many ways uh, in terms of what they were looking for and what they didn't have and what we could offer them in addition to that. So I think it takes, you know, um, an ego that needs to stay in check and uh, humility that we want to listen to everybody in an organization as you described earlier. I certainly do that. I'm sure you do that as well. And make sure we're listening to the people that we're serving. So the humility and the willingness to listen, if we're saying that great leadership is a really important aspect of building a leader, uh, winning team is, is part of it. And I'll also say in the news industry, we visit newspapers all the time. We're just trying to figure out right. what works. And you know, we had the Arkansas Gazette in our office this week. And it's, so it's the same thing where there's a sharing of ideas and best practices. You're probably not going to share your um, you know, you're not going to share your practice routine, but sharing what works for your ticket office. And, and again, the idea of a league being help, healthy and collaborating with the other owners for the betterment of the overall right. industry is one of, the, one of the ways that sports differs. Yeah, from. and I would say one of the things, I can speak about the NFL, you know, yep. um, the great owners in the, the NFL this year is 100 years old, but the greatest owners in the history of the league 
have ones, when it comes to league matters, uh, they've subordinated what was the best thing for their mm -hmm. own franchise to, in the case of the NFL, what's best thing for the Blue Shield, for the NFL Shield. Um, and there are, you know, many examples of that, but, you know, not all owners are like that. The great owners that are, have great peer recognition within the league um, and really represent the foundation for how the league is going to grow are ones that are thinking about league first and their club second. Not when it comes to Sundays or whatever the nights or afternoons you play on, but when it comes to league matters, what's the best thing for our shield? What's the best thing for the game, if you will? Phil, what's a great, so since we're talking about this idea of great leadership, can you tell us a great leadership story that either you've learned from or that you feel? Well, I, you know, I'll piggyback on where Arthur was. I, yeah. I think, and th this is, I'm, I'm like on the thinnest ice possible to try to make this point politically correctly. So here, here, here it goes. I'm very excited. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would just implore you to explore the history of all of our games. And when you look over the 100 years of NFL, 150 of baseball, the hockey, each one of our industries has gone through challenges, like industry-wide challenges mm -hmm. that, that, that the industry, it, it's, there was a crossroads. And I, 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 I echo uh, having known the history about the NFL and at a critical time in the NFL's path to greatness, there were decisions made and big market, small market alike did what was best right. for the game. Yeah. Um, if you look at our history in Major League Baseball, I, I will simply say that the same thing did not happen. And those two industries in the, you know, different sports, but very much the same business of sport, um, it, it created two very different paths. And uh, we've had a lot of success in baseball and we have an opportunity today that we're at a crossroads in baseball. And I think it's time to figure out as an industry with the shield first, or in our case, the, you know, the, the, the silhouetted baseball uh, you know, player, what to do for the game of baseball. And I would tell you, um, having been in it, not for a long time, but 14 years is long enough to have an opinion, we've got the best group of ownership right now and leadership at the league level to actually take on the challenge of changing the game in a way that's gonna help all teams and lift the industry to a future of health and prosperity. But um, it, it hasn't always been that way and, and we have an opportunity to do, do something special, and I, I hope you're going to see us do that in the next couple of years. Um, can you talk to us about leadership? You talked about how, for you, it's really important to listen. What else is a leadership strategy that you employ? Like, I, I'll, um, can I, I'm going to answer that in two different ways, if, yes. this, if that's okay with you. I'm going to tell two stories. Um, one, one of them, um, and I'm, I'm not going to claim to be a great leader um, through this story, but, but I am the leader of my, my organization. And, um, we had a we had a terrible season two years ago, um, and um, Montreal Canadiens is is uh, it's a love brand. It's not when when the Canadians don't win, that's yeah. all you hear about everywhere. The water cooler, uh, mm. the coffee machine. The, you walk into a store, people stare at you and tell, oh, "There he is." <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Stop running yeah, errands. Yeah, it's yeah. it's a love brand. People <laughs> love it, or they get angry when they're not winning. Um, and uh, when we had, we had a really terrible season and the overwhelming majority of media and fans were calling for me to fire the GM and fire the coach um, because we didn't have one winning season. And there are all kinds of reasons why you might have a winning season or you might not have a winning season. But if you believe in your people, yes, you need to listen to your fans. I completely agree. But there are times when you have to use your judgment to um, stick with what you have if you believe you have good leaders. Because an organization is not built in a season. And if you really have the right people in place, um, you need to take a longer term perspective uh, with the right people um, and not panic and not uh, do things that um, you might regret. Because when you do make change, everything else changes. Um, the, a new coach brings in new players, a new GM wants to make changes and everything gets turned around again, and it's exciting for the fans, but it's not necessarily gonna build a winning organization. Mm -hmm. um, that's an experience, I've, I've only been doing this for 10 years um, with the Canadians, but that's probably one of, the, one of the hardest decisions I've made because the public wanted everyone's head, and I knew it wasn't the right decision, and it was, um, it was a tough one, so, um, and, I'm, and now we're all, like the media never admits this, 
Uh, right? what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Now they say. <laughs> now now think, the media says, I think says, that's well, true. Isn't it, <laughs> isn't it wonderful how good the GM and the coach is? Yeah. I'm like, what? You didn't say that a year ago. Um, <laughs> But uh, so that's, uh, I think, patience and, and not panicking uh, when you know it's not the right thing to do, I think is really important. Um, and then the other thing is we, we uh, all three of us, we represent love, love brands. Uh, like I said, they're brands that people are very passionate about. And um, that brand, we, we at all times need to represent our brands at the highest level of integrity that you possibly can have um, in everything that we do. Um, and, you know, I learned that from, from my father, uh, who uh, uh, used to get mad at me when I was dirty on the ice. And he'd say, Jeff, you realize your name is written on the back of your jersey. And those people are potential future beer customers. <laughs> and, uh, That's a lot of pressure for a six-year-old. <laughs> yeah. and, and and, but he's right. He's yeah. right. Those people, if they don't like me, they might not drink my beer. And so, um, uh, so for me, this whole idea of humility and representing the brand um, is a really important concept as an owner. Um, and it goes to the extent, I mean, the Montreal, whoever has been to Montreal before, uh, although Boston might be just as bad, the drivers are terrible. Um, and they'll <laughs> cut you off and they'll honk at you. And, and when you own a, a team like the Montreal Canadiens and someone cuts you off, you're not, you're not uh, giving them the finger. You say, thank you very much for cutting yeah, me off. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, go ahead, please. I love right, you. Yeah. I love you. Thank you. Yeah. You that, right? um, but you have to be that way. You have to be that way at all times because we're representing something that is so important to people and they watch everything that we do. So what, to, you're saying listening, you're saying um, patience, not panicking. Panicking is not a good leadership strategy. It's not a good strategy. And, yeah. uh, and you're saying representing the brand at all times, representing the, the organization. And really in everything we do. And yeah. everything that you do is, yeah. is the important yeah. things for leadership. Do you have anything else on leadership that you'd want to add? Well, I, I mean, I would agree with all those points. I think they're all very valid. Um, I think it's important as, as um, owners, leaders, uh, that we walk the talk, mm -hmm. that uh, spend time with uh, our associates. I spend a lot of time in our stadium walking around, talking to our associates, uh, making, making sure they feel empowered, make sure they feel important. Uh, I think we do that, and I do that in all of our businesses. I get to know all of our players. Um, it's easier on the NFL side because they all speak English. Uh, about half of our players in Atlanta United don't, uh, so I don't speak Spanish, unfortunately, which is my problem, not theirs. But, um, you know, I, I get to know them. I get to know their families. I get to know their interests. I get to know... Um, I'm not making football decisions. They don't call me about that, but um, I do care about them personally so they don't feel like a commodity. They feel like a person, mm. and they feel like they're being respected. Uh, and, and, you know, I... I run our organization in terms of free agency as though every player, even on the contract, can be a free agent. So we have to earn, uh, whether it's a contract year or not, we want to earn their desire to stay with us uh, because of the way they're treated and the way we listen to them. And you do you can respond to them in a variety of ways. Players tell you a variety of things too, not just, I mean, in terms of the way they may be playing a particular sport, they'll tell you that too, and good coaches are good listeners but also in terms of facilities and things they need and all the messaging you've heard before up here about making sure that everybody in the organization feels like this is the best or nothing. That happens to be the slogan of Mercedes-Benz, which is on our stadium, but it's our philosophy as well. Uh, so, you know, people want to be connected to an organization like that and one where you're spending time, in our case, like HD, would be on the floor with an orange apron on, walking around, touching, feeling, you know, associates, customers, being engaged with the people that are actually getting mostly closely engaged with our customers at HD. So, um, the, in addition to sports, another thing that that's held in common is is our experience at Babson. And I've heard you I heard you give an interview where you talked about some of the things that you learned from your experience here. Well, I probably looking back. I mean, I, I you know I. You know, I, I was not a great high school student. I was okay. If I had to apply Babson today with my high school grades, I majored in sports in high school. I don't know That's that I, I would have gotten in, into Babson today. But I mean, I think uh, the greatest opportunity that I had at Babson beyond the learning was a chance to experience what leadership would really mm. do. I was president of student class. I was president of student government. I, I was I'm involved in a whole variety of different things. And I think that opportunity in a smaller college like Babson gave me a chance to explore, you know, my own identity and build some self-confidence and self-awareness that became very important to me as my career advanced from there. So 
I, I had a great experience on campus. I, I loved the school, and you know, as we all do here. So, Phil, you yeah. said you were talking to me off backstage about what you learned from Babson. Yeah. So uh, for me, Babson, it, I really love the case study format and the yeah. practical learning. And and I came out of here. We were yeah. already, yeah. as I mentioned earlier, in a diversified series of different family businesses and. Um, you know, the real take home is it gives you the ability to break down business mm. into its components of functionality, including, you know, and, and the overriding theme of that is leadership and culture. But you, you came out feeling that, and we do a lot of venture capital investing, and, and it's all about getting to the core of a business. What's going to make it work? What's the, what's the product or service? What's the customer base? How do you get to them? How quickly? What's the sales cycle? What's the resources, cash flow? You know, so all of those business things that we all learned at Babson to come out with the confidence of being able to apply those skills to any business is what sure. helps you take on things like taking on a baseball franchise having never you know operated in sport before that that's definitely something I can say from uh, take home from Babson and then the, the last thing I'll say on the earlier points yep. is um, the, the one thing in terms of leadership and community and and all of us are connected to franchises and brands that are interwoven into the community. It, it's just different in sport than in any other business. I mean, you can be a, a Coke guy or a Pepsi guy or a Nike guy or a Reebok guy or whatever, but the connectivity that you have in a community in sport is unique. And so one of the things we've tried to do is really take that stewardship and that responsibility and opportunity seriously. And we try to use the venue and the team to create connectivity to help nonprofits raise money mm. by using our game day experience to do that and, and weave that brand into good things in the community. And, and it's altruistic work that we do intentionally, but you know, strategically, it keeps the, the equity and the faith and belief in the franchise and the brand through the tough times of non-performance. And in my market, unfortunately, I, I have to prepare for more of those than maybe some other <laughs> franchises. So, uh, but, but again, I, I can't, all of the earlier things I shared, though, is learning from BAPS and just the confidence to be able to deploy that against any business opportunity or strategy is, is really valuable. And Jeff, while you were not smart enough to get your undergrad degree from Babson, <laughs> you did get your graduate degree from Babson. And backstage, you were talking about the, your biggest takeaway from the graduate degree. Yeah, so I, I mean, um, I was uh, going into my MBA. I was a typical Canadian, shy, low profile, um, and uh, Canadian, just typical Canadian. Um, <laughs> And uh, I think uh, the way I look at Babson for me, because uh, I did it when I was relatively young, uh, my MBA, it, for me it was a game changer. So I, I left Babson feeling confident that I could negotiate something, feeling confident that I could analyze something, feeling confident that I could work on a team, mm -hmm. feeling confident that I could lead a team. All these things that you, that you experience in two years at Babson, um, I, didn't, I didn't have that beforehand. Um, and so I was sort of scared to do some of those things. And, and then you, you actually go through real case studies or real situations um, and you get taught by uh, professors who have had professional experiences as well um, and you leave feeling, feeling like you, you can do this. Mm. Um, and I think for me it was all about confidence and, uh, and it was a game changer for me. So there are some ways that sports is a terrible analogy for other businesses but in the sense of, of what it takes to building a winning team that we've explored today, I think that there's a lot that we can all learn from, from creating the right organizational culture and then hiring, putting together the talent that fits with that organizational culture, creating a distinct strategy for your business, constantly innovating and anticipating how your industry is changing, and great leadership. And then the sixth one would probably be going to Babson. Thank you all so much yeah, for, for joining us today. This has been a great...